Hello and welcome to Dangerous Ideas. I'm Lee Camp. To the tens of thousands of you watching around the world, thank you for being here. Big show today. I've got uh, an, an icon and a friend of mine, Professor Richard Wolf. He'll be on in just a minute. Uh, but I have so many other important stories for you as well. After I after I finish up with Professor Wolf, I'll be talking about the leaked audio recording from the UK government. Uh, admitting, and I'll play the recording, admitting that uh, Israel is violating international humanitarian law. Uh, also, there is uh, breaking news of Israel bombing the Iranian consulate in Damascus, killing a, a top general, one of the Iranian top generals there, uh, widening this war into something that is very, very scary. Not that it hasn't been for 178 days now. It has been uh, scary and horrific since day one. But anyway, I'll be covering all that and much more in just a few minutes. But let's get started with the head. Let's start with the headliner and then we'll go backwards from there. Uh, truly an honor to have him on the show yet again. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, a friend of mine, but also professor of economics emeritus, University of Massachusetts Amherst, visiting professor at New York School, sorry, New School University in New York. Also, new book coming out. The Sickness is the System, When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself. He has several other books which are bestsellers. Please welcome Richard Wolf. Thank you very much, Lee. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for being here and happy birthday. Thank you. That's a double kindness of yours. Thanks. I remember 36. It's a golden age. Yes, yes. Right, right up there with 37. <laughs> So uh, I wanted to start with China, which is uh, a big, a big presence these days, an important story. Um, uh, if you look at it from kind of an outsider's point of view, watching the mainstream media, on one hand, you have we're, we're told China is evil. They're the most evil country in the world. They have evil spy balloons over our heads. They uh, they they turned TikTok evil. And now we need to stop the evil, evil TikTok. Uh, we're just told that at every level they're evil. And yet, then you also have things such as this. Uh, this is just the other day in Shanghai. And let's go for a second. That is Apple CEO Tim Cook opening the second largest Apple store in existence in China. He says China is one of the most critical partners that apple has so what's what who's who's right and who's wrong here what exactly is going on well here's the the thing that that is perhaps most important there is a new uh neighbor in the neighborhood there is a new player in the world economy and he's got as big a, a, a net to cast across this world as anybody else just slightly smaller than the United States and catching up. I really mean that literally. Uh, this is to give you an idea. One of the measures we have as economists about how big a footprint an economy has in the world is something called the GDP, the gross domestic product. It's a rough measure of how many goods and services are produced in a one year period in a society. It gives you an idea of how big it is. So let me give you some of the relevant numbers. You'd think everybody knows this, but I've learned they don't. And so I start with it. Okay, the GDP of uh, Russia, a country we take seriously, right, is one and a half trillion dollars. The GDP of the United States is 23, 24 trillion dollars. Just to give you an idea, the GDP of Italy is three to four trillion dollars, much more than Russia, for example, and much smaller than the United States. GDPs in Europe are all in single digits, most of them less than five trillion. What's the GDP of China? 17 trillion dollars. You understand? They're the only one in that league other than the United States. And the gap between the United States and China in terms of the size of its economy is shrinking every year. And let me stress that. 
every year for 25 years, economic growth in China has exceeded that of the United States. Even though American presidents and politicians love to say things like, we are the most successful economy in the world. That's not true, hasn't been true for a generation. Let me give you an example. Right now, the estimate of the, China, of the stat statisticians is that GDP in the United States grew maybe roughly 2.5% last year, 2023, the latest year for which we can make estimates. In China, it grew in the same period double that, 5%, maybe 5.5%. No contest, not close. Two to one, three to one are the normal ratios, which is why they're catching up. Therefore, China has shown itself to be the most successful economic growth story in human history, much faster than Western Europe ever was, than the United States was, than Japan was, than any other growth story you have. This is not a statement that everything in China is wonderful. This is not a denial that China has its problems too. It does, of course. But to not understand these basic economic realities is self-delusional if you don't understand what is going on. And you can see what the estimates are of the years immediately ahead, that the Chinese will equal and then pull ahead. Let me show you why it's reasonable to believe in this trajectory. There are two blocks in the world today. There used to be one, the United States and its allies, Western Europe and Japan. That block is now called the G7. The United States, Canada, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and Japan. Seven countries, the United States and its allies. On the other hand, you have China and its allies, known as the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and the six new countries that joined a few months ago. The total output GDP of the United States plus its allies is about 29% of the global total. The total GDP of the BRICS is 33% of the global total. Bottom line, the BRICS is already a bigger economic, there we go, share of world GDP. They crossed in the year 2020, and you can see as they're going down now, uh, sorry, you can see as they're going down the, uh, the situation. So this is the most important thing. The, the second most important thing about China is the fact that it is also the place where the best conditions for economic growth exist for everybody, not just. That's Tim Cook trying to tell you. To yeah, stop I am really, about I'm really sorry about that. I. That's okay. Happy, happy birthday wishes pouring in. <laughs> okay. Um, so what, what, what we really have is we have a situation in which American companies, British companies, Japanese companies, everybody has wanted to go to China for the last 25 years because they're not in the business of ideology. They're in the business of making money. And what China has said to the rest of the world, and which is part of its growth story, is, look, we have a well-educated, well-trained work labor force and we have the biggest one in the world and the wages are lower here than they are in western europe united states and japan by a lot but on top of that we have the biggest fastest growing market in the world well every graduate of business school has been taught if there's a place in the world that has the lowest wages and the fastest growing market that's where you want to be that's where you will succeed. And not going there is self-destructively stupid. So guess what? Tim Cook of Apple, he got the message. So did everybody else. And so what we have is the following rough statistic. Somewhere between 
40 and 50 percent of what comes to the United States from China is manufactured or produced in subsidiaries of American corporations and an even larger percentage of Western capitalist corporations, which have chosen to go to China because it's the profitable thing to do, which means that inside Washington, when they discuss China policy, you have the political types who want to dump on China and demonize China, all the neoconservative, you know, rehash of the Cold War. Yeah. But what you have you that you did not have with the Soviet Union is you have a huge block of the biggest powerful American corporations who want nothing to do with American policy there. They want good, stable, peaceful relations. They have invested hundreds of billions of dollars already in China, and they are eager to do more business, which is why Tim Cook is making that happy video. And that's what's really deciding what's happening in in Washington, not the headlines in the New York Times. That's a playing to the neocons. What's yeah. actually going on is a unique situation in history that the biggest competitor of the United States is also the biggest collaborator with the United States and vice versa with China. They need each other. And out of that may come despite all the hoopla these days, a slowly dawning recognition that they better work out a live and let live arrangement because holding back China is hopeless. The United States has tried that. It's embarrassing. They tried to hobble the Huawei Corporation. They just issued the best results they've had in four years. Didn't work. They tried to hobble their computer chip industry. It didn't work. They tried to hobble their electric vehicle industry. They now produce the best electric vehicles at the lowest price in the world. The only reason the United States isn't full of them is that we make them pay a 27.5% tariff to bring those cars in. When that stops, as it already has in Europe, you're going to see those cars come here as they already are in Europe. Coming to terms with China is the number one issue for this country in the years ahead. And it better get its head ready to do that because the alternative is failure and or nuclear war, which is just failure spelled otherwise. All excellent points. I, I did find it funny that I went to, uh, I was in China for uh, four days uh, last year into Beijing and I found it funny that here in the U.S. we're told they're so evil and, you know, you, you even look at something Chinese and you're going to it's going to turn you into a stone or something. And you get there and it's Starbucks and McDonald's and Tesla's and <laughs> just all over the place. Not only that, but if you travel to the big cities, you'll see that they have, they have a more modern, cleaner transportation system. They, you know, Americans say, oh, look, there's empty apartment buildings, not understanding that socialist planning does that on purpose. Imagine that. They want the apartment ready when the people are ready to go there rather than have the people go live in slums for five years before they can build it. it, it the game here of transforming their achievement, which is stunning, into a series of bumble and fumblings, that's the kind of childish propaganda that does the world no good. You really, you're embarrassed every time you see somebody here in the United States resort to that kind of cheap, cheap games playing. You just gave me the perfect segue saying, uh, talking about uh, China's infrastructure and everything. Um, uh, I wanted to jump to a seemingly unrelated topic, but it is related. The Baltimore Bridge collapse. I'm here in Baltimore. And at first glance, you'd say that has nothing to do with capitalism. But you look a little deeper and you find out that these bridges were built for container ships that were tiny in the 1970s. They were built to withstand them. And now the container ships are 25 size times that size. They're the size of the Empire State Building. And these bridges have not been updated in any way. Then on top of that, you have the boat that lost power. Work. It was with a company, Maersk, 
that has been uh, uh, fined and and other other um, things have been taken against them. Other action been taken against them for uh, coming down hard on whistleblowers and making sure that whistleblowers cannot speak out against unsafe conditions uh, or things that are not working on their ships. And so I was wondering if you could talk a minute about that, about infrastructure and about capitalism and how these things are all linked. Yeah. It- very, very important point, and they're linked very intimately. I'm going to give you just two examples. Start with Maersk, the uh, shipping company. I'm I'm part of a profession that for 30 years has celebrated globalization. We were told these wonderful stories backed up by economists' research showing you, look at the advantages if we produce things over there in China or Brazil or India or wherever and bring them here. We can make them more cheaply. It won't cost us as much. And and the little detail that it's done for profit, they keep quiet. It's all for you, the consumer, who will get a better deal. Well, the only way you can think like that is if you don't count the costs. For example, if you produce far away, and there are interruptions to the supply line for any reason, you're not going to get the product. And we've had that over and over again. Here's a second example. If you produce far away and ship here, you have to foul the ocean and the air with the transport of all of those things on all of those ships that dump their garbage and pollute the water. And who's going to pay for all of that? What are the costs of a never counted? We only count the costs that we have to care about. But in fact, if you did count the costs, it turns out this was not a profitable thing to do at all. It was privately profitable for the companies that could pay workers a lot less and ship it over because they didn't have to pay for the damage they did to the environment. We're all paying with the climate disasters we live with now. Here's a second example. If you want to ship like that and you want the big ships to contain the mountains of uh, containers that we can see, well, then you have to take other steps like reinforcing the bridges, raising the bridges, changing the harbors. They didn't do that. They didn't want to spend the money. The shipping company just wants to move the stuff from point A to point B on their big boats. Well, if you don't take care of all of this, you're going to have these results. Fixing those bridges would have been much cheaper than now having to repair this disaster. And you wouldn't have had the interruptions and you could have planned for them. This is capitalism at its most irrational. And now finally, the political part of it. Politicians don't Prepare. They don't take the steps to fix a bridge, to prepare a bridge, to raise a bridge, to protect the bridge, all the things that are necessary. You know what that's called? Infrastructure. Now, why is it that we neglect our infrastructure? Even the U.S. government right now admits that tens of thousands of bridges in America are not in adequate condition. They're unsafe right now as we're speaking. Why is that? And the answer is Our politicians know that the name of the game in politics is this. You raise money from the rich corporations and so on to put the money together to run a political campaign in which you tell public relations nonsense to the mass of people, hoping to get them to vote for you. And the way we discuss politics is, how can you cut my taxes? That's the Republican mantra, which half the Democrats fall for. Well, The problem of a politician is I can't do all the things that the people and the businesses want me to do if they don't give me the taxes, but they vote me out and don't give me money if I raise their taxes. How do I solve this problem? There are two ways, and this is economics. One, which we know they do, is to borrow. That way you don't have to tax people and you got the money to spend. And you just run up the government's debt until... We have today's position where we are about to spend more in the next couple of years paying off debt than we give to the Defense Department for the American military, which is no small reality. But here's the even worse part of it. What you can hide if you're a politician is deferred maintenance. You can't stop the schools from running and you can't stop the roads from running. But you know what you can do? 
You cannot maintain your existing infrastructure. You can postpone the repair work you should do. You can defer the protective buildings that you should do around the pilings that hold up a bridge. No one will notice. It'll take a few years before the accident happens, the breakdown occurs. And by that time, you've moved on to higher office and the next poor person in your job politically has to face the music. It's an incentive system for deferred maintenance, which is why our infrastructure is in the awful shape. It's the way we've organized corporations to be profit-driven in capitalism above all else and put them in the position to control the politicians who react by hiding so they can look like they're not raising taxes. It's a sick, broken system, and it shows itself in moments like the end of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. But the lesson has to be learned. Otherwise, we'll hear all about this one and that one making this mistake or that mistake. That solves nothing. We just rebuild this bridge. We're just waiting for the next one. And by the way, a few months ago, there were these things. Remember the ship uh, in the Suez Canal that got stuck angularly? Mm. That's the same story. If you're going to yeah. run these monster ships, you got to deal with this. In capitalist systems, you got a built-in incentive not to do the work. And there was a very similar uh, crash of a ship against a bridge that brought down the whole bridge in Florida in 1980. Yeah. And they did not bother to update this bridge since 1980 when they saw what could happen. Uh, but yeah, you bring up a great point about the externalities. Uh, you know, there's no there's no money in it. There's no profit in it to uh, to re re rebuild, reprotect these bridges uh, for modern times, and it's you know it's it's similar to the externalities of uh, a McDonald's hamburger. You know, they pay a few cents, but they don't pay for the environmental damage done from uh, billions of cows being farmed across America. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's and not the fouling of the water and all the medical bills of the people who lived in the water that and drank the water that was foul. All of those costs, which we as a society have to bear, the corporations don't have to not only not pay for it, but don't have to count it. So they can tell us this magical nonsense about it's profitable, therefore we should do it. No, jackass, it's profitable for you, but for the society as a whole, it's a losing proposition and we shouldn't do it. No, no, we cannot go there. We have to always exempt capitalism from the story. That's what the major media in this country yeah. do. How to sanitize each and every disaster as it unfolds so no one should see a link between that unfolding disaster and the economic system we live in. It's amazing that they've gotten away with it as long as they have. In these last couple of minutes, uh, I saved an easy question for you. Can humans evolve past capitalism? <laughs> you know, <laughs> A, a, a person, I forget who it was, but a person that we all know made a speech. And one of the lines in that very memorable was that it was, he said, or was she, I don't remember. It's easier to give people an idea of the end of the world in terms of climate disaster than to have them understand the end of capitalism. And, and let me reassure anybody who's in that situation. Every other system in the history of the world, slavery, feudalism, ancient village structures, uh, self-employment systems, every one of them was born, evolved over time, and then died and gave room to another one. There's absolutely no reason to believe that capitalism is going to be the one exception in the history of the world. Come on. People in every system include those who want to believe it'll last forever. You and I know people who think life, their own, will last forever. And they're really let down as age shows them not going to happen. Capitalism has been born. We know that. It's been around for two or three centuries. So it's had a good run. You know what the next stage is? It's over. It's finished. The question isn't whether. Come on. You and I know. The question is only when, and when 
might be just about now. <laughs> That's the best news I've heard in a long time. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Wolf. And yeah, uh, just wonderful points made. You know, every every system thinks that that system will last forever. Ask the French monarchy or hell, ask almost every monarchy <laughs> whether they'll last forever. Thank you again. And I hope everyone checks out the new book, uh, The Sickness is the System. And everyone should grab that. Can't thank you enough. All right. Thank you very much, Lee, and for your programs as well. Appreciate it. All right, Professor Richard Wolf, always amazing and always enlightening. Okay, let's get into all of this uh, latest information about Israel's special genocide operation. Uh, massive protests around the world. This seems to happen almost uh, every every weekend now, uh, usually on weekends. Uh, here is 30,000 people in New York City this past weekend uh, protesting against this genocide, which is now in day 178, 178 days. Did you think, you know, I have a pretty low view of humanity. Did you think we could get through 178 days of in-your-face genocide and not have uh, I don't know, the, the the world stand up, I guess, in a stronger way. Much of the world is standing up, but not the people in power. Uh, 178 days of this utter, utter just, uh, I, I don't even know what to call it, just re revolting lack of humanity, just a moral abyss of what Israel is doing right now. Thank you, Designer VAP, for the donation over on Rumble. You say thank you so much for all your hard work. We're getting the truth out there and love Richard Wolf. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the donation. Your super chats honestly keep this show going. So I mentioned it at the uh, at the top, but let's let's go over it again. That Israel just assassinated a, a top Iranian general. Uh, this, of course, enlarges this regional conflict. Now, I suppose you could call what's going on in the region a conflict. What's going on in Gaza is just a genocide, straight up ethnic cleansing. Anyway, Israel. Oh, actually, this is a separate story. I was going to bring both of these stories at the same time. The uh, the strike on the Iranian general. But since I pulled this one up, let's do this one first. Israeli parliament passed a law paving the way to get rid of Al Jazeera, to force the closure of Al Jazeera. Uh, in Israel, and Prime Minister Netanyahu promises to act immediately to stop all of Al Jazeera's uh, reporting. And why do you think that is? Do you think that co is because Israel is such a good guy, and they're acting right, and they're treating people right, and they just don't like Al Jazeera's reporting as they uh, act right and uh, don't break any international laws and don't commit genocide? Or, or... Do you think they want to get rid of Al Jazeera because Al Jazeera is reporting the truth on their genocide? Which do you think it is? Which one could it be? And by the way, you you know, the, the famous quote, the first uh, victim of war is the truth. Uh, we've certainly seen that with all of Israel's absolute garbage propaganda that they've been spitting out and continue to spit out. Uh, although if I have time, I'm going to bring you a story about how uh, American Jewish communities say they uh, that Israel has left them hanging with not enough propaganda to support this genocide, which is kind of laughable. It's like you have not trained, you have not given up enough, given us enough good lies to support this genocide. Anyway, I'll get to that in a few minutes. But so Netanyahu getting ready to ban one of the main news outlets in Israel. Same thing was done in Ukraine in the U.S. proxy war there, right? Banning all. Uh, media that did not simply agree with the Ukrainian military line of, of propaganda. But anyway, this is the other story I wanted to bring you. Uh, I meant to pull up. Several have been killed in Israeli strike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. So now Israel is bombing Syria. They've been bombing Syria for a while, but they're also assassinating high-level Iranians. Uh Several people have been killed in an Israeli airstrike that flattened the Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria. According to Iranian state media and Syrian authorities, Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Zahedi, 
a senior commander in the elite Quds force was among at least five people killed in the attack. Iranian state media reported on Monday. So again, you know, Israel's killing so many people that it's like, why is this one important? Well, this one's important because it, uh, shows that Israel is very much so widening this their genocide into a war with other countries, especially Iran. They've wanted Iran to be destroyed for many years now. Netanyahu's gone up in front of the UN for many years saying, oh, Iran's about to get a nuclear bomb and they're about to hit us. Remember when he held up his Wiley Coyote picture of a bomb, like the round, like bowling ball bombs, which, you know, we all we all use those every day. I can't tell you the number of bowling ball bombs I've used recently. I use a lot of anvils, too. I like to drop anvils on people that, that have wronged me. Anyway, got up there in front of the UN and said, look at this bowling ball bomb. Uh, Iran has a nuclear, about to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, of course, none of it true, um, but that's what Netanyahu does. And he, he, the reason he does that is because he wants the UN and the US to continue to attack Iran. Now, obviously, under Donald Trump, uh, they, Donald Trump and the military, US military assassinated the top Iranian general, um, Soleimani, and Biden has continued to attack Iran in many ways, just not with bombs, really, um, but with every economic war uh, that a, a tool in their toolkit. Anyway, Israel widening this war to assassinate Iranian generals. Okay, let's get to the leaked audio of the top levels of the UK government. This is pretty, it's, it's not shocking. The truth is not that shocking, but the fact that it was leaked is pretty shocking. Uh, by the way, real quick, everybody, um, please make sure you hit subscribe, hit the bell icon. Our channel is growing by leaps and bounds, and it's thanks to you guys. Please let people know about this channel. Let them know that this is where you get your news, or at least some of your news. Let them know that this is the antidote to corporate media, and let them know that we get together four days a week for solidarity and truth on this channel, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And of course, you can watch it anytime afterwards. But thank you all. Make sure you hit subscribe on Rumble. Make sure you hit uh, uh, follow over on Rumble. And make sure you hit the bell icon. And on YouTube, you have different bell options that you have to hit. So hit the all option if you want to be told about this show. But still, you won't get that many alerts. So please just show up. And uh, the only other thing is if you want to uh, donate to the show, you can go to my link tree there on the screen, linktree.com slash Lee Camp. But you can also donate via the Super, super Chats, uh, and I will uh, address as many of those Super Chat questions and comments as I can, as I have time for. And those are some ways to support this show. All right. Let's get to this leaked audio. I'm going to play some of it, <clears throat> although it is hard to hear, but still worth it. Anyway, this is and this is in The Guardian, uh, leaked uh, UK government lawyers say Israel is breaking international law, claims Tory in leaked recording. So the British government has received advice from its lawyers. Uh, I'm going to play that in the clip, so I don't need to tell you about it now. But Alice Kearns, who is the conservative chair of the House of Commons Select Committee on Foreign Affairs. So this is a top government official of the conservative party, the Tories. Um, anyway, let's, let's hear some of this clip. So she's addressing, obviously this is uh, internal. This is not meant for public release. Luckily someone got hold of it. Uh, but here we go. And you might want to, if you're watching, uh, if you're watching this, you probably want to read as the words come up because it is uh, difficult to hear. Secondly, the Foreign Office has received official legal advice that Israel has broken international humanitarian law, but the government has not announced it. They have not said it. They haven't stopped arms export. They've done a few very... So let me just read that again because... This is, this is the most important part of the entire clip. I'll play more of it. But she says, the Foreign Office, you know, basically they're you know, Defense Department or whatever they call the State Department, uh, their, their State Department. Foreign Office has received official legal advice... Okay. The that Israel that Israel has broken international humanitarian law, which means war crimes. I mean, these are absolutely crimes, but the government has not announced it. Now, here's the thing. This is not just, a, oh, isn't that silly that the government has not announced it? Uh, 
And yeah, I'm sorry. I know the volume's low. It's just, it's how this clip is online. Not sure why uh, I have it all the way up. Anyway, uh, the government not announcing it is a big deal because they are, first of all, they're legally obligated to announce when they receive these types of law filings, but they also are legally supposed to stop shipping arms to a country that has violated humanitarian law, international humanitarian law. That is part of international law. That's part of, uh, I don't know, in the UK, but at least in the US, we have a law on the books of the United States, those books that says we will not ship arms or we cannot legally ship arms to a country that is violating law by stopping aid, our aid, from getting into the victims area. So basically we're violating our own laws, not just international laws. The U S is violating our own laws when we ship guns and military weaponry and missiles and F 35. Now, apparently we're sending Israel, uh, we're violating our own law. And so this is a big news and a big leak and it's having ramifications in the, uh, in the UK right now. Thank you, Don, for the donation. Still misredacted tonight and the whole team involved. The media is increasingly under control worldwide. Keep streaming. Thank you, Don. I appreciate it. Yes, I misredacted tonight, too. Uh, it was a great show, if I can say so myself. Anyway, so they received legal advice. Israel is breaking international law, and they've not revealed it, not admitted it, and are still shipping arms to Israel. And all, but the government has not announced. They have not said it. They haven't stopped arms export. They've done a few very small sanctions on Israeli settlers. So, yeah, they've done some very tiny little sanctions, little tiny sanctions on Israeli settlers. This is the same thing the U.S. has done. The U.S. has put sanctions, quote unquote, on the settlers in the West Bank, which, yes, those settlers are violating law and they're, and they're greatly harming the Palestinians that they kick off their land. And so it's, it is horrific. Yeah, those settlers should not be doing that. But over on in Gaza, there's a fucking genocide, okay? There's a genocide going on. And the U.S. is like, uh, we're going to put sanctions on those 12 settlers there. It's just like, dude, you guys are atrocious. Atrocious. Uh, all right, let me get, skip to one other part here. Well, I'll just let it play, but she talks about the settlers. And everyone internationally has agreed that settlers are illegal, that they shouldn't be doing what they're doing, and the way they mm -hmm. yeah. continue the violence being put in. The position that David has taken, which She says the position that David Cameron has taken, the head of the Tories. She's in the same position as me, while I still come very tough on him, is that Israel has an absolute right to self defense. That Israel has a right to self-defense. Uh, well, I'll just I'll just finish playing this real quick. I have sat in bunkers and worked with Israeli soldiers and been very proud to do so. I'll do it again tomorrow. But the right to self-defense has a limit in law. It is not limitless. Okay, so this is really important because this is coming from someone that is not critical of Israel, really. This is someone who is pro-genocide. This is the right wing of the UK. This is someone who has basically endorsed and facilitated this genocide from day one. Uh, as she said, I have sat in bunkers with Israeli military and I would do it again tomorrow. Oh, really? You want to join this genocide tomorrow? That's fascinating. That's an interesting thing to in here. But the reason this is important is because even the right wing of the UK is saying this is too much. Like, this is beyond the pale. Even those people that are like, yay, genocide, we're fine with it. Basically, they're genociding, uh, genociding non-white people, so fine by us. Uh, you know, Britain, they have no history of genocide, right? Uh, so... Totally fine with it, largely, until it goes beyond the line where it starts to look really bad for the empire. And when I say the empire, I mean the U.S. empire, which includes the British empire, because nowadays it's kind of one in the same. There's not a lot of difference in it. Uh, Britain and Europe have largely become vassal states to the United States. I think the one thing that stops Britain from maybe being quite the vassal state the other European countries are is that is the... Uh, the, the fact that uh, London and England are kind of the financial center of a lot of the world, that makes a difference. But anyway, uh, she, even she is saying, and she says David Cameron, the head of the Tories, is uh, agrees with her, that 
this is the right to defense, quote unquote, is not limitless. Now, of course, when anyone says right to defense, it's bullshit to begin with. I mean, just calling this defense in any way. And then when you are an occupier in a land, you are the occupiers. You can't call any of it defense. Uh, it, it, so it's the whole right to defense thing is laughable from the jump. But I think this is important because this is the right wing. This is the pro-Israel, most pro-Israel side of British politics. Corbyn uh, on the more left side has been pretty damn good on Israel and Palestine for years. And of course, they use that to destroy his career because how dare he come out against an apartheid regime with an open air prison with millions of people trapped in it? How dare he do that? Um, anyway, this leak has kind of gone viral, especially in the UK. It's It's big news. And it, uh, it shows that even the most bloodthirsty thirsty right-wing side of the UK and the US is feeling a lot of pressure to no longer stand for limitless genocide, to no longer endorse limitless genocide. Okay, moving on. Let's get to another story about how this uh, this ongoing Hamas systematic rape story has collapsed. Now, if and and again, I know some of you are new to the show, so I'll keep repeating it. I don't support everything Hamas does. I a lot there were a lot of horrible things done on October seventh, uh, and it, it it I am not like yeah, yeah, but they're all freedom fighters and stuff like I don't do that shit, uh, but. That doesn't mean we should believe just false crap. It doesn't mean we should believe that every person killed on October 7th was killed by Hamas and not IDF. We now know the IDF obliterated a lot of those people killed on October 7th. We know that Hamas's goal was to take hostages, not to kill people. Uh, so we, we and, and the evidence keeps pouring in, even though there have been mass efforts to cover it all up. But that aside, we have the systematic rape story, which I've brought to you how ridiculous it was from the beginning. I've brought to you how the one of the three journalists who was not a journalist at all before that story, because, you know, New York Times was like, let's bring in some non-journal. You know what this story that we're making up needs is some non-journalists getting in on this. Come on, guys. Come on, come all. Anyway. They brought in someone who'd never done any journalism. Of the three people, you have one who'd never done journalism and had retweeted uh, genocidal uh, uh, quotes about, about Gaza. You have another one who had, their, the extent of their New York Times writing was like cooking and, uh, and food critic stuff. And then you have another one who's a longtime New York uh, Gettleman, longtime New, New York Times journalist. So you basically have one journalist. Uh, but of course, New York Times is propaganda. So you have one honed propagandist, really good at it, been there a while, out of the three. Uh, other guys writing about bunt cakes, and they're like, you know, I think I think the person who's never done journalism and the person who writes about bunt cakes, you two are really going to nail this Hamas systematic rape story. Anyway, that being said, uh, I've brought to you so many ways that this has fallen apart, the systematic rape stuff. Here is the latest of how it is falling apart. From the gray zone, Israeli propagandist behind Hamas rape nar narrative exposed as a grifter and a fraud. As the founder of the so-called Civil Commission on October 7th crimes by Hamas against women and children. <laughs> when do you think they founded that? October 8th? Israel lawyer uh, Kohav Elkayam Levy has been a go-to source for Western media organizations pushing the narrative that the Palestinian mil militants carried out sexual assault on a massive and systematic basis when they attacked Israel. And there's a big difference between uh, whether there was any sexual violence and whether there was systematic sexual violence. I don't think they've brought evidence of either, but as I've said from day one, if there's evidence of sexual violence, okay, that's horrific. I'm against that. Uh, but they haven't brought it forward. So bring it forward if it exists. Bring it forward. And But that is a big difference, a far cry. It's basically the difference between, uh, you know, uh, someone murdering a person and, so, and a serial killer who uh, killed 100 people. Anyway, 
Elka Yam Levy has starred in a factually challenged CNN special on the topic, narrated by the fervently pro-Israel host Jake Tapper. I, I made fun of Tapper the other day for his garbage. Oh, yeah, he was very upset that AOC called it genocide. And so Tapper was like, was like, but you can't show intent. Oh, you can't? You can't show intent that Israel's committing genocide? Their secretary of defense, or whatever they call it, uh, Yoav Gallant, Called the, called everyone in Gaza human animals. Basically, just kill them all. That is genocidal intent right there. One sentence. Anyway, uh, she starred in a CNN special, and she uh, and CNN identified her as, quote, an expert in human rights law who organized a civil committee to document evidence. Haaretz featured Elka Yam Levy as the subject of a puff piece, which misleadingly claimed that her work presents a horrifying picture that leaves no room for doubt. On October 7th, Hamas terrorists systematically carried out acts of rape and sexual violence. Sorry, sexual abuse. Uh, that was a quote, even though it actually leaves loads of room for doubt. Because all you got to do is actually look at what the evidence is. And you, the, the, by the way, one of the New York journalists that had never done journalism before who wrote that piece, she said in the podcast where she was interviewed about the piece that she went to every rape center, every police, like everywhere she could ever go in Israel to try and find uh, survivors, victims, witnesses, anything, and found nothing. And just said, and in the podcast she goes, but so I knew I just had to find someone, which is the opposite of an investigation. Like if you're investigating something, you want to see the truth. You don't want to just basically make something up where she was like, I couldn't find anything. So I had to find something. Anyway, December 6, 2023, members of the White House National Security Council and assistant to the president and director of Gender Policy Council, Jennifer Klein, hosted El Kagam Levy in Washington to hear about her work to gather testimony, a document of events, develop comprehensive accounting, etc. Israel's largest newspaper, I don't know if it's pronounced Inet or Ynet, but anyway, published a damning expose accusing, this is the uh, update, accusing Elkalam, Elkiam Levy of ripping off major donors, including a member of the Biden administration, spreading fake Hamas atrocity tales, and failing to deliver on her promise of a major report about sexual violence on October 7th. People have disassociated themselves from her because her research is inaccurate, unquote. That's an Israeli government official told the newspaper. So these are the most pro-genocide, pro-propaganda people you can imagine. And they're saying, quote, people have disassociated themselves from her because her research is inaccurate. This is who the, C is the CNN expose, the CNN special, had as their main source. Is someone that even Israel pro-genocide, pro-propaganda people are backing away from. To continue a quote from the Israeli government government official, after all, the whole story is that they want to accuse us of spreading fake news, and her methodology was neither good nor accurate. I think by methodology they mean information. So basically, the Israeli propagandists are backing away from her because they're like, we want to look like we are telling the truth, and she's just spitting pure lies. Government officials were particularly incensed that Elke Yam Levy spread discredited claims that a Hamas militant cut a fetus from a pregnant woman before raping the woman, a lie first spread by confirmed fraudster Yossi Landau of the scandal-stained Zaka organization. I told you all about Zaka the other day. Uh, they're, they're really, they're like a comedy sketch, Zaka is. They're a first responder group that have no... No training in being first responders. They're not medics. They're not EMTs. They just show up on crime scenes and start making up propaganda. Anyway, the quote, the story about the pregnant woman who had uh, her stomach cut open, a story that was proven to be untrue, and she spread it in the international press. The official complained. It's no joke. Little by little, professionals began to distance themselves from her because she is unreliable. So anyway, I don't need to give you every detail, but. Yet again, we see every source of this garbage. And there are stories out of October 7th that are legit and awful. And that is what Israel should be touting. But the reason they're touting this garbage, this and, and the U.S. media uh, is touting this garbage and this these falsehoods. The reason is because they've done 
focus testing, which I also brought you a couple of weeks ago. It was leaked. They did focus testing and found out people are far more troubled by systematic rape claims than by systematic murder claims for some odd reason. And, and both are horrific, but people are apparently just far more worried about, uh, uh, far more concerned and upset by systematic rape than systematic murder. And so Israel and the U.S. media and the U.S. government are pushing these rape things, even though they're false. That's, that's to sum it up in two sentences, that's it. And every one of these people is just, it, it all becomes, slowly but surely, it's all outed as bullshit. Okay, next up, let's get to Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Professor Jeffrey Sachs talking about this latest attack on uh, Russia, right? The, uh, the, the concert venue attack that killed 140 or did it get to 170? I think it was 140 some uh, people. Horrific, horrific attack. And I brought you a couple of weeks ago, every detail of the U S connection to ISIS K and ISIS. Uh, I didn't bring you every detail. That'd be kind of impossible, but I brought you a bunch of details of the U S connections to ISIS and ISIS K and Professor Jeffrey Sachs kind of obliterates this idea that the U.S. had nothing to do and did not believe what, well, oh, weird concert attack, crazy. Anyway, and, and Professor Jeffrey Sachs, I believe Columbia University, highly pr pr respected professor, but he is, he is based when it comes to U.S. foreign policy. And so I'm going to play that clip in just a second as well as much more that's all coming up at rumble.com slash Lee Camp. Free to watch there. Rumble.com slash Lee Camp. Also on my locals page. Those of you on locals, you make this show possible. Thank you. Love y'all. Love y'all. Uh, but if you're looking for the free version, that's rumble.com slash Lee Camp. Head over to rumble.com slash Lee Camp. Click the first tab. Uh, that's, uh, what's it titled? It's titled uh, either Professor Richard Wolf or it's titled uh, Leaked Audio uh, from the UK. Anyway. Click on that one. It'll take you to this live stream, except it'll be on Rumble rather than where you're watching it right now. And I will see you in just a few minutes. Uh, dip, 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 not even minutes. It's like 30 seconds, honestly. For those of you.